Hello. Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, it's really great to see this full audience. Um, I want to start, well, my name is Paige Johnston. I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs here at the GSD. And I'm going to start tonight's event by acknowledging that the Harvard Graduate School of Design is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past, present, and future, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. This school also recognizes the work of the Harvard University Native American program in cultivating the relationships that led to the creation of this acknowledgement. For those of you watching the lecture online, to enable live captioning, click the box that says CC at the bottom of the Vimeo window. I also invite you to join us for an upcoming public program. On Tuesday, November 14th, Katrine Mossback, a landscape architect and founder of the Paris-based design firm Mossback Paysagiste and the magazine Page Passage, will deliver the Aga Khan program lecture. For more information about this and other programs, visit the GSD's website. And now I'll hand it over to Grace Law, Chair of the Architecture Department, to introduce tonight's speaker. Grace. Thank you all for being here. As we ponder uh, the Massachusetts land acknowledgement spoken before each GSD event, we are reminded of what Pierre Vittorio Orelli and his co-authors call the original sin in his 2019 essay, Promised Land, Housing from Commodification to Cooperation. The essay suggests that the privatization of land is the original sin that undergirds all others, the first moment of legalized theft to which we can trace the ailments and alienations of the present. Spoken bluntly, they state, there is no housing affordability without access to land. This fundamental fact is especially foundational for Pierre, whose work is deeply concerned with issues of housing, domesticity, and how we live together. The essay further explicates the historical arc of private property, the inner workings of its political economy, its profound consequences on the present, and on alternative models of housing all with a scholarly rigor so characteristic of Pierre Vittorio's writing. Educated at the Berlage Institute and TU Delft, where Pierre earned his PhD in 2005, he is the author of countless books, to name a few, The Project of Autonomy, Politics and Architecture Within and Against Capitalism, The City as a Project, and one of the newest, Architecture and Abstraction. With his design practice dogma, he has authored a myriad of additional titles, Loveless, Minimum Dwelling and Its Discontents, and Living and Working, among others. He is prolific. Yet, what is perhaps most powerful about Pierre's work is that, on the one hand, he holds the historian's command of the past in order to explain the present. On the other, he deploys the tool of theoretical provocation as a speculative, projective instrument for architectural imagination. In this twinned approach, Pierre deftly pursues design, spatially identifying, critiquing, and intervening in the opportunities of the present. Some characterize such pursuits as utopian, often interchanging the terms theoretical and utopian. Yesterday, however, Pierre was so generous as to indulge me in a podcast uh, interview for Talking Practice, in which he was careful to make a distinction between a utopian project versus a theoretical one. For Pierre, the work of dogma is decidedly theoretical, not utopian, as his critics have espoused. Why is this distinction important? The word utopia itself offers us some clues. From the Greek ou, which means not, and topos, place, utopia literally means no place or not place a word whose first use in Sir Thomas More's 1516 book, Utopia, writes an account of a fictional imaginary place where an ideal society organizes itself socially, culturally, 
architecturally and geographically on a remote island away, very far away from the real. For Pierre, his pursuits are the opposite in that they are grounded in the exigencies of the built environment, the very real problems of our cities and society. And these projects could most certainly be physically realized. So to be careful not to confuse the unbuilt with the utopian, the theoretical project proposes to design the mechanisms and forms that underwrite society and collective life in this time and in this place. Indeed, Pierre, mobilizes scenarios in a way that retains investment in architecture and form making and form as process, explicated in his Log 30 essay, the necessary attitude to reinvent the world. Throughout his projects and writing, Pierre oscillates between what has been, what is, and what might be. This dialogue is not naive to the reality at hand, but rather intervenes in it, operating with speculative specificity and foresight in the margins between a place and many a place. One such example of Pierre's prescience is his influence on our own core for pedagogy. In 2015, for the 41st issue of Harvard Design Magazine Family Planning, he wrote with his partner at Dogma, Martino Tatara, an essay on the idea of transforming office space into domestic dwelling. Dogma's proposal converted a specific office block in Brussels that diagnosed a similar decline of the corporate office for us to study in Chelsea, Massachusetts, providing inspiration for our own Core 4 housing studio coordinated by Jenny French. The generic office building and its uncertain future becomes the site to repurpose the ubiquitous empty space plaguing the contemporary urban landscape. Pierre's influence on our school, albeit at a distance, is acute, and I'm very jealous of EPFL, where he leads a course entitled The Origins of Modern Domestic Space, which is a three-year trajectory dedicated to a comprehensive history of dwelling. Like his essay prefiguring our core for pedagogy, Pierre's work over the last 20 years invests in what we now recognize as the most pressing contemporary concerns of the city. For example, the crisis of housing, and investigates these issues through our core disciplinary tool of drawing, sometimes even in pencil and ink. As we see in his meditations on composition, projects like 30 non-compositional drawings entitled The Marriage of Reason and Squalor, Pierre leverages representational and formal economy, techniques of collage, one-point perspective, and abstraction to underscore the instability of program and to evoke the potential within the anonymity of industrial or generic architecture. In considering these drawings and Pierre's approach, an architecture of abstraction, he is careful to suggest that abstraction is not a deliberate retreat from the world, but rather arises from the material conditions of buildings themselves. So tonight, Pierre Vittorio will share a body of dogma research on the architectural form of the Longhouse, so far exhibited at the Triennale di Milano and the Toronto Metropolitan University. Recalling his previous prolific work on typology, he challenges us to reconsider conventions and to more deeply contemplate the collective past and future of our built environment. Please join me in welcoming Pierre Vittorio Orelli. Thank you, Grace, for your uh, generous introduction, and thank you all for coming uh, uh, tonight. Um, of course, as Grace already uh, said in her introduction, I'm not, uh, um, I will not present my own work. Um, in fact, I will present the work of Dogma, which is a practice uh, I co-founded uh, with uh, Martino Tattara. And uh, um, the work uh, that I'm going to present you is a, is a research, uh, which is not yet uh, uh, finished, called The Long House. And uh, I should really acknowledge the fact that uh, on this research uh, worked uh, a lot of uh, people, actually all the people that worked in our office in the last uh, uh, four or five uh, years, and I'm really happy that one of them actually is uh, here uh, tonight with us. Um, 
Uh, before I start uh, uh, to show you the, uh, the research on the longhouse, uh, allow me to say that uh, uh, this research is uh, within a, a very long uh, uh, trajectory, that we uh, started a dogma more or less 10 years ago, uh, whose goal is actually uh, a sort of uh, uh, investigation uh, on the history uh, of domestic space. Uh, the first uh, installment of this research was uh, the, uh, this book, uh, The Room of One's Own, which is a sort of uh, history of the private, uh, private room. Uh, the second installment uh, was uh, Loveless, uh, which is a study on a more recent um, house type, the minimum uh, uh, dwelling. And the uh, third uh, installment uh, will be uh, the book on the on the long gas, which I will uh, present you uh, tonight. Uh, what is really characteristic of all this uh, research is, of course, uh, the fact that, uh, as also an architectural office, we use a lot of drawing uh, as, a, as a means of investigation. Uh, but uh, uh, these drawings are not abstractions uh, from history. So, uh, in a way, the books are a constant dialectic between uh, historical specificity, but also uh, the graphic investigation uh, of the uh, artifacts that we, the case studies that we approach uh, in, this, uh, in this work. And, uh, and this, of course, is also the case of the Longhouse. A lot of uh, images that you will see tonight, not all of them, of course, are in fact uh, drawings that we have produced uh, at, uh, at Dogma. Um, the long house actually uh, can be defined uh, as a long uh, and narrow house, which can contain an extended family, a kin group, uh, a clan, a community, uh, and a village. Uh, the word actually uh, originated uh, in medieval England. Um, exactly uh, more or less uh, between the 14th and uh, 15th century, so at the end, actually, of the Middle Age, uh, when uh, a type of this type of habitation, which was very common uh, among peasants, uh, started to gradually uh, disappear and uh, became actually a prerogative only of wealthy uh, peasants and, and landowners. And it's at this moment that the word longhouse really addressed a very specific type uh, of habitations. Uh, interestingly enough, in the 19th century, when uh, English and Dutch uh, um, um, travelers went to um, Southeast Asia, they apply actually this uh, uh, name uh, to um, uh, habitations uh, that uh, existed especially in the island of uh, Borneo. Uh, but of course, in this case, uh, uh, the longhouse was not actually the house of a family or an extensive family like uh, in England and Scotland, but often was a house that contained an entire uh, village. So in a way, although uh, the, the, the house was a very different kind of household, they actually applied the same Name. At the same time, uh, the term longhouse uh, um, was popularized by the self-thought anthropologist uh, Lewis Henry Morgan uh, in his uh, very well-known study uh, on the League uh, of the Audonoshoni, uh, which actually he published in the mid of uh, 19th century. Uh, as you might know, uh, the studies uh, of Morgan on this uh, very important uh, um, uh, uh, native uh, people uh, of uh, North America, had a huge uh, influence uh, also on uh, Marx uh, and Engels. Actually, Engels' uh, critique on the family, property, and state was really based on Morgan's uh, uh, writings. And Morgan actually was really the one that uh, made the longhouse uh, a very important topic in anthropological studies. Also, as you know, uh, Audonoshoni uh, means literally people uh, uh, of the longhouse. Uh, and of course, were known uh, by English and French uh, uh, colonial settlers as the uh, Iroquois, but in fact, Audonoshoni was really the name through which they uh, called themselves. Um, uh, actually, the, the description by Morgan of the longhouse is actually quite beautiful. Uh, longhouse generally is from 50 to 100. And uh, uh, 130 feet in length uh, by about 16 uh, wide, with partitions at intervals of about uh, 10 or 12 uh, feet uh, or two lengths uh, of the body. 
In fact, uh, in many longhouses, the body is really the measure uh, of this type uh, of dwelling. Each apartment was, in fact, uh, a separate uh, house, uh, having a fire uh, in the center and accommodating two families, uh, uh, one upon each side of the fire. Thus, a house of 120 feet long would contain 10 fires and 20 uh, families. This is a type of illustration that Morgan uh, provided, then you see actually that Morgan really insists on this kind of rhythmic cadence uh, through which the longhouse uh, was actually uh, organized that would ensure a very good balance between part uh, and whole. Also because in the Adorno Shoni, uh, it was very important to maintain as, mu as much as possible a kind of democratic um, distribution of power and resources, and this kind of even subdivision of the longhouse was an important instrument through which that was uh, achieve. But of course, the longhouse uh, exists in many parts of the world. And to this day, there are a lot of uh, publications, uh, a lot of studies uh, on this uh, uh, house type uh, um, from actually the famous uh, uh, photographic report by the German photographer Hedda Morrison, Life in a Longhouse, uh, to uh, Peter Metlaff's uh, uh, classic, uh, The Life of the Longhouse. But somehow, all this literature usually focuses on one specific uh, longhouse culture. So. Um, the ambition uh, that we had at Dogma was to somehow uh, compose uh, uh, an atlas that would uh, compare uh, different longhouses that exist or existed uh, in different parts of the world. Of course, uh, uh, we didn't have any uh, universalizing ambition. We didn't want to uh, build a kind of enlightenment project of comparing uh, everything according to one uh, uh, canon. In fact, uh, this map uh, that you see, uh, that map actually all the, long, the 42 case studies that we have uh, uh, taken in consideration in our research doesn't really say much because there is no one single ecological or functional or symbolic or ritual reason why longhouses uh, actually were uh, built. And in many cases, uh, uh, longhouses uh, were built uh, in places where people who belong to this uh, house type were confronted with also different uh, way of dwelling. So in a way, uh, the people who uh, live, was living or continue to live in longhouses knows uh, that their way of life, uh, their way of dwelling, is very specific. Uh, in a way, one can say that uh, their choice to live in a longhouse is very political in the original sense of the word politics, which is to choose actually the best way to, uh, to live. Um, of course, uh, as I said, we were not interested to uh, arrive to an essentializing, uh, let's say, uh, idea of the longhouse. On the contrary, by comparing uh, all these uh, case studies, we were more interested in, uh, in differences. Um, but we also didn't want to shy away to make some general uh, remark. And here you see actually three uh, very different uh, examples. Uh, the Gogodola actually longhouse in Papua uh, New uh, Guinea, the Salish Sea uh, Plank House uh, in the Northwest, uh, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, and the Banden Karemik Longhouse uh, in uh, by Bilani uh, Czech Republic. Uh, so houses that, longhouses that were built uh, in very different different places at very different uh, uh, times. And yet you see actually uh, some very common thread uh, across these different examples. One that for us was really the beginning of our interest in the longhouse is how the structure, um, uh, especially the load bearing structure, is very visible, uh, is very, I would say, uh, vis visually and, and tectonically very powerful, and in a way defines not just the uh, structure of the longhouse, but also its internal partition, its internal subdivision, as if the structure is really uh, giving a rhythm to the life that unfolds uh, within this uh, kind of uh, house. When we actually look to the scale of the settlement, uh, we also realize that the longhouse has a very strong uh, uh, directionality. 
um, and that's actually one of its most ritualized uh, aspect. So whether it's only one longhouse where an entire village live under one roof, or when there are many longhouses actually very um, uh, tight, uh, composing a very tight uh, formation, or where uh, the longhouses actually are sparse, we realize that they always follow one direction. It's very uh, rare to find uh, uh, settlements of longhouses where uh, the longhouses are not sharing the same, uh, let's say, direction, which is sometimes given by a river, sometimes by the shores of a lake, or sometimes by very important uh, geographic landmarks like, uh, for example, mountains. Although we were not trying to generalize actually one type of longhouse, by comparing them, we realized that uh, in a way we can condense this very vast uh, uh, landscape uh, of examples into four uh, emerging uh, types. And here, I really want to insist uh, on the fact that when we talk about types, uh, especially if we refer back to this uh, famous definition by Catremer de Cancy, uh, we always talk about something that is actually vague. Uh, so we shouldn't uh, actually uh, understand types uh, as uh, very uh, rigid uh, patterns uh, of buildings. Uh, as you may remember, Catremer said uh, uh, the uh, type is not a model to copy, it's a structure of how things come together. And in fact, I would say that even these diagrams uh, are in a way misleading because in fact, uh, they already suggest a, a very strict geometry for the organization of the building. And yet, uh, allow me to use them to uh, address uh, these four uh, possible, uh, let's say, types. The first one, of course, is the veranda type, uh, perhaps one of the most uh, remarkable, where actually one uh, big space that go across the whole length of the longhouse give access to more private households. The tripartite, uh, uh, the uh, so-called open, and the hierarchical. So the uh, veranda, of course, as I uh, said, is a very common uh, structure for longhouses, especially those built in Southeast uh, uh, Asia. And they uh, visualize, actually, they specialize in a very powerful way the uh, relationship between individual households and collect communal, communal space. The tripartite is less uh, frequent, uh, and yet there are a couple of very uh, interesting uh, uh, examples. Uh, in fact, the subdivision is uh, really uh, according to the main axis uh, of the house. Uh, like, for example, in the case of the Gogodola longhouse uh, or the Gaio uh, longhouse. And actually, what is interesting that often this uh, type reflect very strong gender uh, polarities. For example, in the Gogodola, the central space is the male space, the lateral space is the female space. Or in the Gaio, the central space uh, are the uh, private households. And then the two uh, spaces uh, on the side, the two verandas, one is for male and one is for uh, female. But the most interesting type uh, is actually what we call, the, in a slightly improper way, the open one. So the longhouse where, in fact, uh, there are uh, no or very few, uh, let's say, obstructing uh, uh, partitions. Um, and where, in fact, uh, uh, the uh, entirety of the hall uh, is very visible. And yet, uh, as you will see in some of the examples I will show you later, uh, the post, uh, the structural elements, in a way, were often understood by the inhabitants as almost in, uh, forming, actually, virtual walls, uh, virtual lines that would define, actually, the pattern of use uh, of those uh, interiors. And finally, the last uh, type is the hierarchical, the uh, type where the longhouse is divided uh, in uh, different spaces, which are not uh, even. Like, for example, in the case of the veranda house, where there is always like one main space and, uh, let's say, spaces that are ancillary. Uh, and we've noticed that, with few exceptions, uh, um, which are very important, uh, this uh, type always reflect a more hierarchical organization of the household, where there is one space that is more important than others. Something that, of course, is very familiar to our, let's say, idea of uh, domesticity. So. 
So let me now uh, sketch uh, uh, eight uh, tentative theses about uh, what really the longhouse is about. Uh, I have to say to that these are very tentative theses, uh, and for each of them there are always exceptions, and exceptions are very important. Um, so that's why the, I call them tentative. Uh, it's something that we are still debating and discussing also within uh, our research. But nevertheless, they are important. At this point, since we are completing this research, uh, to have theses uh, for us is actually very, uh, very crucial, very important. The first thesis, the longhouse is not a collective house, but a communal form of dwelling. And here, actually, I want to stress the difference between collective and communal, words that we often use uh, uh, interchangeably. Collective, in a way, always implies its opposite, to be also individual. And of course, within the history of modern de domesticity, this dialectic, uh, or let's say dichotomy, better, is actually very important, very, very strong. So when we are collective, we know that there is always actually uh, si uh, uh, a kind of individual a sphere where we can be individual. In the longhouse, uh, this dialectic doesn't exist. Uh, people who live in the longhouse are communal, whether they are sharing uh, space or they are actually in their own uh, more private uh, household. And sometimes, actually, as you will see in some example, the more communal part of the longhouse is exactly the space of uh, private uh, dwelling, if we can use the word private. Of course, I'm using this word, which is not really the right word, but uh, just for the sake of um, clarity. Let's say the space where a certain privacy can be, can be achieved. The second thesis is that the longhouse combines living and working, uh, sacred and profane, within the same structure. In fact, uh, uh, if you look to many uh, settlements uh, made of longhouses, uh, all the buildings are the same. Uh, it's very um, occasional you have a, a different building, uh, but in fact, uh, uh, even if there is a building that is actually more representative or uh, of the community, is actually always uh, replicating the same form uh, of the of the longhouse. The spatial arrangement of the longhouse is defined by the ritualization of inhabitants' life and consists in giving special emphasis on places and uh, habitual behavior. This is actually very important, and in a way it's a thesis that can be extended to many pre-modern uh, forms of dwelling, uh, where ritual uh, is not uh, only uh, addressing the ceremonial uh, aspects of life, but actually every everyday uh, aspect of our quotidian uh, uh, activities, uh, uh, which are in fact uh, em em emphasized by the space uh, in which they unfold. In fact, I would argue that the, the, the long out is almost a kind of theatrical stage in which even the most quotidian moments of life are in fact emphasized and made legible. The structure of the long house defines hierarchies, gender roles, and positions of every inhabitant in a legible way. In a way, every domestic space, even modern domestic space, defines gender roles, hierarchies, uh, uh, but always in a hidden way, in an almost naturalized way. This is not the case of longhouses, uh, where, in fact, as I said before, those roles are played out almost theatrically, in a, as I said, in a, in a legible way, through actually the rituals that, in a way, inform uh, them, but also by the architecture that responds uh, to these rituals. Longhouses are either one village into one house, which is very much the case of many longhouses in, uh, for example, Southeast uh, Asia, or a unit within a village, and they are mostly based on a domestic mode of production. In other words, uh, many longhouse settlements are self-sufficient. Of course, they have some form of trade, in some cases, uh, but most of them are self-sufficient, meaning they are based on a, a um, economy that is uh, very much local and localized around the longhouse uh, itself. A large number of longhouses, especially the biggest one, can be interpreted as manifestation of house societies. You might know that this term, house society, was introduced by Claude Lévi-Strauss, uh, 
um, it's a very controversial uh, theory. Uh, Levi-Strauss actually proposed uh, this concept because he realized that many anthropologists were at pain to understand the uh, keen group logic of many uh, indigenous communities. And he realized that sometimes when these uh, relationships are very complex and irreducible to the uh, logic of kin, uh, perhaps it's the house itself, especially when many communities uh, use the house as their own representation, uh, really as a, as a social structure, like in the case of the Audonoshoni, that how society better serve the purpose uh, of reading uh, social formations that really uh, understand the household and not keen relationships or family relationships as actually their own uh, social uh, their own social form, and of course this uh, uh, definition of the longhouses how society doesn't apply to all the longhouses we have researched, especially in the case of the European ones. This. Uh, theory might not, uh, actually is not uh, correct, but we found very useful to uh, return to this concept in order to uh, emphasize what is really specific uh, about the longhouse compared to other forms of dwelling. All example of longhouses are defined by polar relationships in which top and bottom, left and right, periphery and center, front and back, are clearly defined and represented in the architecture itself. So, uh, if you allow me to oversimplify here, the longhouse is the opposite of what today we would call a flexible space. Uh, it's a space where symmetries, uh, relationships are very uh, defined always in a polar way. And in a way, the longhouse often serve to emphasize uh, those uh, relationships. And finally, the last uh, thesis, uh, in longhouse, the part is always understood in relationship with the whole. A uh, part involved is both the architectural and the social organization of longhouse uh, societies. Now, let's look to a few examples and see actually how this uh, thesis uh, uh, might allow us to uh, really emphasize what is special about longhouses. And let's start with longhouses that, in a way, are still uh, visible today, and some of them are still inhabited, although not at the scale in which they were, uh, in fact, uh, in the past. Uh, one should say that the uh, states actually made any effort in the history of Longhouse to, to discourage people uh, to live uh, in these uh, forms of dwelling, so not many have remained, actually. To be, uh, to be seen in their original form. Certainly one of the most uh, uh, interesting and radical example of longhouse is the Iban longhouse in the, that exists, especially in the state of Sarawak uh, in uh, Malaysia. Um, and of course, uh, from the drawing, you see that uh, one of the fundamental logic uh, of the Iban longhouse which can actually uh, host until like 200 from 30 to 200 uh, people in one uh, house. One of the fundamental characteristics uh, of the Iban Longhouse is that it's always uh, placed uh, along the river. And in fact, uh, 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 the several Longhouse that um, belong to the same river form actually an even larger, let's say, uh, long, uh, uh, Longhouse. And what is actually uh, interesting that the longhouse is almost uh, uh, perceived by the inhabitants as a segment uh, of the river. This is actually why its plan is organized uh, as a series of uh, strips. The strips, of course, of the private uh, uh, dwellings, the, the apartments that host families of uh, five to seven uh, people. Uh, the Ruai, which is the big uh, gallery that connects uh, all the apartments. And then the Tanju, which is actually this platform that in fact uh, connects the, the, the longhouse to the, to the landscape in front, which is the path that connects all the longhouses and the river. Uh, itself. In spite of the even subdivision uh, of the apartments, uh, what is very interesting is that uh, the inhabitants of the longhouse, the Iban longhouse, uh, can have uh, very strong differences in terms of wealth and status. Uh, but these differences are not uh, played out uh, in the uh, organization uh, of, the, uh, of the household. In fact, uh, uh, the most important apartment is usually in the middle and is the uh, apartment uh, uh, of the chief 
uh, of the longhouse, and it's in fact uh, exactly the same apartment as the others. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, position of the chief apartment defines the longhouse, gives to the longhouse a very strong sense of orientation, uh, defines two parts, uh, the down river and the up uh, river. Uh, and the down river is the, the, the up river is the most uh, prestigious uh, part of the longhouse. The down river actually is the least, uh, let's say, prestigious. And in fact, uh, the, the, the down river is uh, built first and the up river is built, uh, built uh, uh, after. And as you can see, the most uh, uh, defining element uh, of this architecture are the posts, which of course is the load bearing. Uh, uh, part of the load bearing structure, but they also define the different uh, areas of the uh, building. Uh, you see that the uh, post uh, uh, at the center becomes uh, denser because they divide, in fact, uh, the gallery in three parts. The first part, which is the very uh, small one, uh, I cannot uh, maybe. So this part is almost uh, an extension, uh, let's say, of the, um, of the private apartment. And in fact, sometimes there are also staircases that lead to the loft uh, that belongs, in fact, to the uh, private uh, uh, apartment. Uh, and then, actually, the uh, center, the Ruai, is actually the passage that allow people to uh, walk across the uh, longhouse, while the third uh, Asyl actually is uh, uh, the space where visitors uh, can stay and, and sleep, actually. Uh, so in a way, the load bearing structure is both the, the structure of the house, but is also what defines the different uh, spaces of the house. Uh, and actually, even when uh, there are no walls, uh, in a way, the posts uh, are almost tracing invisible partitions. Um, and so people know exactly where they are. Uh, so in a way, this is actually the opposite of an open uh, space, if you want. Um, let's look to another uh, interesting example, which is the Kayang Longhouse, also in, uh, in sa the state of uh, uh, Sarawak. Actually, it's a much uh, larger type of longhouse, because unlike the previous one, it can host uh, apartments for extended families that can go from seven to 30, actually, uh, members. And uh, in fact, you see that the, uh, let's say, the, the, um, uh, the veranda is actually much, uh, much smaller. Uh, and then you see that uh, the apartments actually have different uh, rooms and also a little patio to have uh, natural light. And uh, in order to accommodate these uh, larger families, uh, the back of the house is actually flexible. In fact, families can negotiate how much space they can take for uh, the sleeping uh, arrangements. And it's interesting because this flexibility is only kept at the back in order to not upset the evenness, let's say, of the internal subdivision, so to remind people that uh, even if you have a larger family, uh, you occupy a very specific place uh, in the house that is equal uh, to the other one of, the, uh, of, your, uh, of your peers. Um, so you see that uh, also partitions, uh, uh, actually, that are walls, uh, play a very important role. Towards the veranda, the walls are very impermeable. But uh, the walls that uh, divide the different uh, uh, household actually have uh, some kind of uh, openings and permeability so that people are constantly aware, especially in their own private houses, that they are living next to their uh, neighbors. And this sort of awareness uh, of having uh, neighbors is one of the fundamental characteristics uh, of the uh, uh, Southeast uh, East Asian uh, uh, longhouse. And in fact, this is uh, very visible in one of the most interesting examples of Southeast Asian longhouse, the Gerai longhouse in West uh, Kalimantan, uh, Indonesia. Uh, and of course, as you can see, uh, the organization of this longhouse is very similar to the previous one. You always have these uh, private uh, uh, apartments. Uh, for uh, families, uh, and then this uh, very generous uh, veranda. You see that the body apartments and the veranda are striated, are uh, 
organized as a series of strips, and each of these strips actually is identified with a different kind of program. So for the inhabitants of Longhouse, the idea of program and function actually is very, very important. And in fact, uh, sometimes this is uh, defined not only by post, but also by uh, platforms. And then, of course, you have the classic uh, bipartition gallery, veranda, and private apartments. Yet. Uh, it's exactly this organization that led many, especially Western uh, scholars, for a very long time to understand the, uh, the longhouse as a sort of, uh, um, let's say, uh, juxtaposition of uh, collective and individual uh, spaces. Uh, yet this reading has been contradicted by uh, a famous uh, uh, anthropology scholar, uh, Christine Halliwell, who wrote actually one of the best text uh, essay that exists uh, on the longhouse, Good Walls Make Bad uh, Neighborhood, because she argued that uh, if you look to the Gerai uh, 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 language, uh, Sawa, of course, means outside. Uh, and of course, the uh, Sawa is actually the veranda. Lawang means uh, inner area. But in fact, uh, uh, the word Sawa is synonymous with Ramo, which means free available to anyone. And by anyone means anyone. So not only the inhabitants of the longhouse, but also people from outside uh, the longhouse. And then Longwang is actually synonymous with Yang Direct, which means that which pertains to the self. And in this case, the self is not the individual self, but is the self of the longhouse itself as a, as a community. So she concludes that uh, the longhouse, the Jerai longhouse, is not a private household and a longhouse community. So you don't have this dichotomy, private apartments, and then the shared uh, space, but longhouse community and those outside the longhouse. And in fact, uh, the, the longhouse really symbolize we towards others. Um, and in fact, uh, Christine Holloway was very impressed by the way in which people were living in those longhouses. She realized that women, for example, were spending a lot of time inside their so-called private uh, dwelling, uh, sitting alone. And she realized at a certain point that uh, it was as they were speaking by themselves. But in fact, uh, having their back against the wall, they were speaking to their neighborhood across the wall. So in a way, she argued that the real communal space of the longhouse is in fact the space of the so-called private uh, apartments. So of course, this completely changed the logic, the idea through which we identify collective versus individual or communal versus uh, uh, private. So in a way, uh, to conclude uh, uh, this uh, first uh, overview, uh, we can say that the longhouse is really sort of gradient, a system of thresholds that constantly mediate the relationship between uh, privacy and publicity. But uh, in every space of the longhouse, the idea of communal uh, way of living uh, is always actually uh, reinforced, especially by the evenness uh, of the subdivision of the, of the spaces. So this really reinforced uh, the idea, the thesis that we were presenting before, the idea of part uh, uh, involved, which means that parts are always understood in, in immediate relationship uh, to the whole. And of course, this idea is very much uh, the case uh, of many longhouses that were built, actually, in this uh, continent, um, especially if we look to certain examples, like the famous Plank House uh, built by the Salish uh, Sea uh, people, uh, a land that extended from uh, contemporary British Columbia to uh, Washington, uh, the state of Washington. These houses actually were very big. Uh, they were known as Plank uh, Houses because they were uh, covered by um, planks of, made of uh, uh, cedar. The structure, as you can see, was very uh, imposing. So there were these very imposing uh, posts. The Salish people, people actually were living here only for the winter season, from November to March. And then they would actually live as uh, hunter-gatherers. And when they were not living uh, uh, in the longhouse, they would dismantle the planks, uh, because they were very precious. Uh, and so they, in order to uh, not having them uh, damaged, they would store them in very specific places uh, and leave actually the structure uh, simply uh, by uh, itself. Uh, it's interesting that the, uh, the, the interior, as you can see, is actually uh, 
looks actually open, but in fact, uh, these monumental posts were partitioning the space in different uh, bays that were almost independent, actually, uh, uh, household, although actually the Salish people usually were, uh, f um, the, the house actually of the Salish people was formed by, uh, let's say, um, uh, very large uh, families. Often they actually also welcome strangers and, and, and visitors. There was a lot of mobility uh, across the different uh, uh, long houses. Uh, so in a way, this very imposing post were not only uh, supporting this monumental structure, but they were also giving a sense of cadence, uh, uh, literally dividing the longhouse uh, through uh, virtual walls. Uh, and in fact, often the posts were uh, uh, almost built as totems uh, that would actually really uh, become almost the sentinels that would uh, uh, guard actually the, uh, the house. A very similar logic uh, uh, is present in one of the most uh, uh, interesting, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, example of uh, longhouse in, uh, in North America, which is the Huron Wendat uh, longhouse. Uh, this is a, a very famous example from the Mantle uh, side in Ontario, which is a settlement that existed between the 16th and 7th uh, century, so pre-contact. Uh, we have something very similar that we have seen uh, before. Uh, we have, in fact, uh, a structure that very uh, much define a system of base uh, made by uh, post. You see this very uh, strict relationship between post and earth. This is exactly what in, uh, individualized the different units uh, of the houses. Like also in many, uh, like in uh, other uh, Iroquoian houses, uh, families would actually occupy the two uh, niche, the two uh, actually uh, platforms built uh, on the side, uh, and then would congregate actually uh, around the earth uh, uh, in the middle uh, uh, passage. Um, uh, in fact, uh, it's interesting because here we see a sort of interesting metamorphosis between an open space and a system uh, of what, what we would call uh, quasi rooms, uh, something that constantly. Uh, mediates between the totality of the longhouse and then the individuality of each uh, uh, component uh, that builds, the social component that builds actually this uh, uh, unity. Uh, what is also interesting is to see how uh, there is almost the, the, the furniture, the structure, the architecture are only one element. Uh, and this was actually not only a matter of functionality was also a reminder uh, to these uh, uh, people of the strong sense of unity that was uh, crucial for their own community. And, and in fact, this is a, a characteristic uh, that we can see across uh, many uh, longhouses built both in North America but also uh, in South America. Somehow, although there are hierarchies uh, sometimes, uh, not all of them are based on egalitarian uh, societies. Like, for example, the uh, Wendant, uh, uh, of course, uh, is a very egalitarian society, or, or the Salish people, but the Tucano uh, or the Marubo actually have, uh, let's say, more hierarchical uh, relationships. But in all of them, uh, there is always an understanding of the whole. So there is always an understanding of the community as a whole, and everything actually is both visible, but within this uh, visibility, there is always, a, a, let's say, a space for retreat, a space for individuality. In fact, in many of these communities, this balance between personhood uh, and uh, the whole community was always the main concern. And the architecture was really an instrument to maintain that balance in the, in the right uh, way. And of course, this balance is exactly what becomes compromise uh, with uh, another type of longhouse where, in fact, uh, hierarchical uh, uh, organization is actually more uh, present. This is uh, the case, uh, especially of longhouses that were uh, built uh, in uh, uh, Europe, uh, with actually few very notable uh, exceptions that I will not uh, present uh, tonight. Uh, one very important uh, example is the Iron Age longhouse that was uh, found uh, in uh, northwestern uh, Europe. This is a very famous example, the Ferdessen Vierde uh, settlement in the Bremenhaven region in uh, west, northwest uh, uh, Germany. 
Actually, what you see in these uh, longhouses is that, uh, unlike the previous examples, uh, in this case, the longhouse is divided in two very different uh, parts. Uh, one part for uh, animals, you see the, the stalls, and one part for uh, humans. This is actually a characteristic of many European longhouses, to have humans and animals sharing actually the same, uh, the same space. This was not only uh, a matter of functionality. Of course, animals would keep warm uh, the interior. It was also a very symbolic and ritual uh, aspect, because in, many, uh, in medieval Europe, uh, the personhood of animals was very important. Uh, you might remember the famous uh, episode of uh, Francis of Assisi preaching to birds. Uh, Francis of Assisi was not crazy. He simply played this very important tradition where animals had a very strong, actually, uh, presence uh, in domestic life. Uh, and in fact, in many examples of, 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 of longhouses, um, you have this coexistence uh, in the same space. At the same time, of course, this created a very strong imbalance division uh, within the space of the longhouse, and especially uh, the presence of only one earth instead of the distributed earth that we have seen before made one sector of the house more important. And in fact, usually uh, the position of the entrance, the position of the earth uh, would uh, define the more uh, public area of the houses. And actually, the most important places for uh, sleeping uh, were usually the ones that were very far away from these two uh, elements. So in a, in a way, the organization of the longhouse here becomes more hierarchical and in a way prize uh, one specific member of the household as the most important, uh, let's say, actor uh, in, the, in the space. This is actually very much uh, uh, the case uh, of the Viking um, longhouse, um, which uh, in fact uh, uh, was a, a house that was um, hosting uh, uh, not only actually uh, free people, but also uh, slaves uh, often. So the house actually was often organized in order to create certain strong hierarchies within the distribution of space. Uh, also, there is something very interesting when we look the settlement form. Uh, Vikings, of course, were especially in the late period, uh, the new uh, uh, Roman uh, cities uh, and Roman uh, uh, city making. Uh, and here we see one of the rare example where the longhouse, which is the anti-city model of house par excellence, uh, start to actually be used uh, to create actually uh, something that looks like a grid iron. In fact, you have this very awkward combination of the longhouse with the, uh, with the structure that later on would become the structure of the also of the modern uh, uh, city. When we look to the uh, interior, we see actually how the interior is much more uh, uh, hierarchic. You have this very big uh, uh, space in the center, which was usually a very ceremonial space. In fact, in the hierarchical type, there is really an emphasis on the house as a ceremonial place rather than as a ritual place, uh, where in fact ceremonies are very aggrandizing uh, to, the, uh, to the household. And then we have these uh, ancillary spaces that were usually either the uh, more private uh, spaces, especially for the family, uh, or uh, let's say the, uh, the storage. Uh, this unevenness uh, becomes actually uh, even more important uh, in the medieval uh, longhouse. And here, actually, we have one of the most uh, really debated and interesting uh, uh, example, which is actually taken from the village of Warren Percy in Yorkshire, England. Uh, it's a village that was destroyed uh, in the 15th uh, century uh, with the enclosures, with the eviction of peasants from uh, common land. Uh, in fact, Warren Percy is uh, often used by archaeologists uh, as one of the best examples to understand the uh, open system, uh, the common field, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the open field system in medieval uh, England. Uh, you see that uh, each house, uh, uh, which would host one extended family, has already actually a sort of private space, uh, which is actually the uh, famous toft, uh, the, the garden, let's say, that existed around uh, the house. But you see something very interesting, that certain houses actually start to settle with a different direction. They're very similar. They're also long houses, but they don't settle according to the common orientation of the other houses. These were the manorial houses, the houses of the feudal, let's say, uh, 
lords, which were in fact richer peasants. So as soon actually they, they acquired that uh, status, they would in fact change uh, the direction of the houses to make them different uh, from the rest of the community. It's interesting that even the church would follow the common orientation of the, of the, of the uh, peasant houses, except the manorial houses would actually disrupt uh, that uh, orientation. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, it's interesting because the manorial houses then internally, they were not that different uh, from the houses of the peasants. Actually, what was different was that they became bigger and they would change, in fact, uh, the uh, orientation. Inside, these houses were very similar to the example we have seen before. Usually, the entrance was more or less in the middle. Next to the entrance, there would be the uh, uh, earth. And then the position of the entrance would divide the house into the buyer, the house for the, uh, the barns for the animals, and actually the uh, house for the, for the family. And you see here a very interesting moment uh, where the open space of the long house start to be actually partitioned with very low, um, actually low walls. So there is still this sort of uh, uh, unitary space of the long house, but there is also a tendency to subdivide the space uh, hierarchically. And in fact, uh, the most uh, important space was actually the room where the head of the family and, and his wife would uh, rest with actually the, uh, also the, the storage, because of course it was the most uh, distant space uh, from, uh, from the entrance. So in a way, although the space is more or less still uh, a unitary space, there is the beginning actually of dividing this space into different uh, uh, hierarchically organized rooms. And yet, uh, uh, it was actually the roof that maintained this uh, unity uh, of the house. In fact, in Warren Percy, we see this tension between an incipient fragmentation uh, of the domestic space that, in a way, goes towards what uh, would become actually the modern subdivision of domestic space into specialized rooms, but also the tendency to maintain the unity of the house. And this kind of idea of the unity of the house, which is achieved especially through the roof, uh, through the carpentry uh, of the roof uh, is one of the fundamental uh, property, architectural and spatial property, let's say, of the, of the long house. And it's exactly that property that will be compromised by the uh, late medieval long house. Uh, here we have a very interesting uh, example from Leatherford in Devonshire in England, which is actually uh, one of the few examples that we can still see of a medieval English uh, long house. You still see the, the two, uh, the bipartition of the house into the buyer for animals. You see actually on the here, and then the, the main house, which here is divided in two uh, spaces, the main hall uh, and actually the bedroom, the, the room for rest. And you see something uh, crucial that is changing uh, that will completely change the uh, organization of the long house. We don't have actually the earth anymore. The earth now is actually the fireplace. And fireplace actually uh, completely displaced the earth from the center of the house to the to the wall, of course, because at this point walls are built uh, in stone, so it's possible to shift the fireplace against the wall. And there is also another fireplace in the bedroom. So in a way, this uh, shift of the earth from center to, uh, to the perimeter completely changed actually the ritual uh, understanding uh, of the longhouse and allow, in fact, uh, this further subdivision uh, into different spaces that, in fact, compromise uh, the unity of the space. And yet, uh, even in this example, um, you can see how the roof maintained the unity. In a way, the roof uh, was always the, the only element that also in this case, where the plan of the longhouse is fragmented, uh, somehow achieve uh, a sense of unity. In fact, uh, the partitions of the long house would never arrive until the end of the roof. We'd always leave actually the continuity of the roof, uh, uh, in fact, uh, visible. So if we compare uh, these plans, we see actually a very different tendency than the examples we have seen uh, before. We see how uh, the 
fragmentation into uh, specific places start to actually disrupt uh, the unity and the rhythmic cadence uh, of the longhouse. And in fact, it's interesting that especially these examples, sorry, especially these uh, uh, examples which are the latest, uh, so uh, examples of longhouse in, in Europe, in a way, start to uh, completely transform the longhouse into a series of uh, specialized rooms that resemble uh, our own modern uh, idea of uh, domesticity. So uh, to conclude, I would like to uh, draw some um, remark out of this uh, comparative analysis. I apologize if I've been very uh, short. I mean, for each of these examples, there would be many things uh, to say. But uh, again, for us, it was very important to understand a possibility of um, extracting, uh, let's say, an understanding uh, of domesticity by comparing all these different, uh, or alternative domesticity by comparing all these uh, uh, examples. So for the sake of discussion, I would like to propose a, a series of uh, um, conclusions. Um, let me say that uh, uh, this uh, research, uh, there is there is nothing to learn from. I mean, it's not a research that we have done to uh, design uh, a longhouse, although actually we have designed a project, which is a longhouse, but it was before actually this uh, research. Um, it, it, for us, research is also, it's not just a way to suggest what to do, uh, but it's also a way to understand uh, where we are by also understanding what is no longer possible. And, we should really uh, understand that the longhouse, unfortunately, is a, is all, is a quasi extinguished uh, mode of dwelling. Uh, and its extinction was not a natural process, was literally a form of destruction, uh, especially by the state that uh, often destroyed not just the longhouse, but also the people who lived uh, in those houses. And we should really remember this. This is perhaps one of the most important points of this uh, research. So the first conclusion is that longhouse complicates uh, the distinction between public and private, uh, collective uh, and uh, individual. Uh, and, and of course, this is, as be, it was clear, actually, from the few examples that I, that I show you. Um, tenancy in the longhouse is never defined by private ownership, uh, but by multiple and reciprocal customs of use and possession. And this is exactly why longhouses were destroyed. This is exactly why the state uh, uh, was so adamant to destroy uh, longhouses and often people that were living in longhouses and force them to live uh, into, let's say, more private uh, form of dwellings because they complicated, actually, uh, and they made almost impossible the imposition of private uh, ownership. The longhouse uh, puts in crisis the very idea of architecture as a form of building, defined by the division between project and construction, intellectual and manual labor. All the longhouses that you have seen were built by the people who live uh, in longhouses. They were responsible for uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, building, the extraction of material, the assembling of material. So in, in all the examples that I've shown you, even the most uh, monumental, there was no uh, specialized labor. There was no division of labor. Everyone was involved, of course, sometimes with different tasks in the building uh, of longhouses. Um, therefore, I would like to propose uh, two more uh, provocative, uh, let's say, uh, points uh, following uh, this one that I just uh, mentioned. The first one is that the longhouse challenge, uh, the idea that a strong, spatial, formal order is always the outcome of an imposition. So the longhouse really is an example of how also uh, self-sufficient communities, in a way, use architecture to give order uh, to their own uh, way of life. And the idea of architecture giving order, of course, has a very bad reputation in our, let's say, postmodern times, but it's exactly how uh, longhouse people use this specific way of dwelling, not just to have a shelter, but to give a very strong, almost theatrical form of order uh, to their way, to their form of, of life. And this led me to the final point, which perhaps is the most, uh, uh, in our opinion, provocative, uh, 
the long gauss suggests the possibility of a strong regular legible building form without uh, architecture, if we assume that architecture is based on the division between intellectual and manual labor. And perhaps this, uh, for us, is uh, one of the most, uh, maybe the only thing from which we can learn from the uh, uh, glorious but also tragic uh, history uh, of the Longhouse. Thank you. Thank you very much for, the, for your talk. Mm. 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 Uh, wow. So I, I usually talk a lot, and so it's kind of a, a moment for me if I'm not able to, 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 to speak at the moment. I think that, that, that your talk was, was breathtaking in so many ways. And, uh, describes uh, just this incredible possibility. Um, it, it opens a, a really incredible set of, of questions. Um, I think, uh, and I'm also going to open it to the floor because I know there are a lot of people here who would like to ask. Um, so I couldn't help but in, in, in the beginning of your conversation, you had mentioned that um, one of the critical aspects of the Longhouse is not the about is we shouldn't describe it as collective uh, because of course the collective represents the uh, there's a, a binary attached to that collective versus the individual uh, and that communal is the real uh, is the real underlying definitive quality that we need to look at so I am curious when I think about that um, is there really no possibility for the emergence of a, of a longhouse in contemporary terms in, in, in the present? I'm, I would love for you to tell us or give us your thoughts about that. Uh, well, we, of course, when we started the research, we have very similar question. We were interested in the, in the longhouse because we thought it's one of the most uh, uh, striking example of collective uh, dwelling. Uh, but then, studying carefully all these uh, uh, cultures, we realized that there was something impossible today to, to reconstruct. Because uh, for these people, the longhouse was a universe. Uh, it was actually their own orienting uh, uh, existential uh, device, uh, which is uncomparable to the way in which we experience our form of dwelling. Uh, and especially it was a form of dwelling, uh, with few exceptions, especially in the last uh, examples, where there was no uh, the sense of legal private ownership. And of course, uh, our own way of dwelling is completely subsumed uh, by uh, forms of ownership that would prevent even the most uh, quotidian aspects uh, of those houses, the way they were built, uh, the way they would access land, the way they would take care of the land. So it's, we are very careful in, in this research not to suggest too easily that this, um, this type of habitation can become like a model for contemporary dwelling. We are, on the contrary, we see this more as a cautionary tale. Uh, and especially what we want to make clear through this research is how our modern idea of domestic space was built uh, on the premises of the destruction of alternative forms of dwelling and alternative forms of life. So it's really a, a research that emphasizes what has been lost. Uh, whether you know, we can recover that in its totality, it's, it's something that goes beyond uh, beyond our research, and I would almost suggest it would require almost the abolition of uh, the, all the actual uh, order, social order that we have now. So yes, well, and, and, and I think that's what's one of the things that was so striking to me. Um, of course, the East Asian, the Indonesian examples, the Malay, Malaysian examples, 
the, those societies are uh, deeply cooperative at their at their origin, and um, when you look at the European examples and you look at the uh, you know the English examples, um, it, you begin to see the of course the the um, influence of the nation state, yeah. the privatization of land, um, and I I even in the example of the manor. Um, uh, the way in which the outward display of wealth and capital um, uh, is foregrounded very prominently in the, in the European version, though we still, of course, imagine, understand that to be pre-modern. Um, so that's interesting because that, that, it, it, it's almost as if the East Asian, and I don't know if you found this along those lines very um, in a in a pronounced way, but it does seem to me that there's that collection uh, it, it definitely speaks to a different kind of cooperative, um, near socialist um, organization. Even though, again, I think it's maybe you could talk a little bit about that. No, actually, you know, this is very interesting because I I should say that uh, uh, it's not entirely correct to say that uh, the you know European examples are already let's say, into a logic that is the logic, uh, let's say, of more modern, uh, uh, let's say, uh, way of, uh, of dwelling. Uh, also, there are examples that I didn't have time to show, like the Neolithic uh, longhouse of band, uh, the band uh, Karamik uh, culture, which actually were very egalitarian. And actually, even in uh, feudal, European feudal society, actually, there was a great deal of cooperation among the commoners. Uh, and often feudal lords have to respect that uh, very carefully. Uh, so there was actually, although we, feudalism has a very bad name, actually in, in feudalism, peasants have a lot of control of their means of production. Uh, and whoever actually was the lord had to constantly negotiate with them uh, very carefully how much he could extract uh, from, from these people. And in fact, uh, uh, even uh, in many medieval villages across Europe, especially uh, in France, in England, you see this sort of, yes, yeah, there is a difference between the manorial house and the peasant's house, but the peasant's house are all the same. I mean, there is a very strong sense of unity and, and cooperation. Uh, so in a, in a way, it's interesting, feudalism, yes, there is hierarchy. In fact, the feudal lord is in charge to a certain extent, but then all the other people are very cooperative. They are very, uh, let's say, organized in a way that is actually very even. Uh, resources are very well evenly distributed. What changed, uh, and I think the house tells a lot about that, is that these are houses that are built around the idea of the family, uh, which is something that in the other longhouses often uh, undermine. I mean, there are families also, of course, in the North American longhouses or in the Southeastern, uh, South uh, East Asian longhouses, but somehow their um, um, organization is fundamentally dependent on the unity uh, of the of the community. Uh, and I think this is actually the, the main difference. In a way, you have cooperation in all the examples, except that the family is actually what the logic of the family, the privatizing logic of the family, is actually what becomes stronger in, in many European cases. So, but with that in mind, I'm, the, the last statement, the longhouse su suggests the possibility of a strong, regular, legible building form without architecture, but that's, a, that's heretical. So I guess the, the, the question that I'm, I'm curious about, isn't that paradoxical? Because you just went through a very strong argument which establishes the, the, the rhythm, the absolute kind of rhythm and cadence that, and the, um, the use of structure to uh, inform uh, programmatic use. I mean, isn't that all? And the insistence that it actually be absolutely regular, despite maybe maybe uh, uh, wealth wealth within the uh, context of the family. So maybe t t tell us about that because it almost feels like that undermines a bit the other pieces of your argument, which are so much about the um, a kind of a, a very established declarative structural rationality. 
which is deeply architectural. Yeah, actually, when we started the research, uh, Martino and I, uh, and then with our collaborators, we, we were really thinking the longhouse as the most archetypical form of architecture. I mean, in fact, that was really our fascination. It's the most archetypal. Uh, more archetypical, yes, mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as an architecture on steroids, if you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> an architecture that really played out all the most uh, essential aspects of what we can define architecture of course, from a, from a Western uh, uh, perspective. But then, of course, we realized something that is very obvious, uh, that uh, the building of these longhouses was never, even the, the largest one, um, which is, of course, something that is common to many forms of pre-modern dwelling. Uh, but of course, what becomes impressive in, in the longhouse is that they are very big. Uh, and their building was never based on division of labor. Now, we have to understand that what we call architecture arcane tecton, it, the institution of architecture always from antiquity imply a division of labor between uh, design and, and building, between what Vitruvio called reasoning uh, and building. No? Uh, in the longhouse, this dichotomy doesn't exist. Uh, the longhouse actually are, as I said, very strong, regular, imposing, I would say, uh, forms of building. Uh, but for us, they're outside architecture. If by architecture we define uh, a building knowledge uh, that is premises on the distinction between design and building. Right. So the longhouse really is an example of how uh, a very monumental form of building uh, cannot be considered architecture. Okay. And in a way, this is a, for us the most important lesson or, or point that we encounter in our study of the longhouse. That's, very, that's a very clarifying point. I, I know we have a lot of people who are very curious to an, ask some questions, so I'm just going to hand it over at the moment. Thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. I was wondering first whether your distinction between the collective and the communal owed something to the classic sociological distinction between Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. And then my second thing, uh, I was wondering also if, you know, you're not actually by the end a little bit reinventing this idea of the pacified pre-modern pre pre etc as if there was no conflict in these long houses as if violence had been only when you know uh, modernity uh, and architecture of course were born because you know the which is very often you know anthropology tends sometimes to have this very pacified vision as opposed to the deep division created by modern society so i wanted to hear you about that because you know you've insisted a lot about the organic nature, the social bond, very, as I say, Gemeinschaft, but there is actually an immense nostalgia at work, usually, uh, when one draws this kind of a position. So I wanted to hear you about that. Well, regarding to conflicts, yes, uh, there are actually, um, there were a lot of conflicts, uh, uh, not, not so much within those communities. For example, the IBAN are known to be very, um, uh, they were very famous as also as warriors, um, but within their community, they were very uh, strong in keeping, uh, in, in playing out their own eventual conflicts in a very ritual way. So to to make them possible, but also to not let them to escalate and disrupt uh, the longhouse. And this is very true of many examples. In a way, the longhouse was really a mechanism, uh, not to eliminate conflicts, uh, but to play them. To, to ritualize them. And for example, we know that in the case of the Salish uh, people, there were almost non-existence uh, rates of, of crime. I mean, there were really societies that have no, let's say, uh, these conflicts would not disrupt into, uh, into lethal, uh, let's say, confrontations. Uh, so I would say that uh, uh, there are conflicts, uh, but uh, the longhouse, unlike actually modern domesticity, where conflicts are repressed and then they you know, explode uh, without any possibility to, to control them. In longhouses, there was a great deal of, um, of negotiation, of uh, constantly playing out, almost in a ritual way, possible disagreements. In order to allow this to happen, um, this is very 
true of many um, uh, First Nations, for example, but at the same time to also keep them uh, not uh, escalate uh, into, into violent confrontations within actually the, the, the community. So, of course, this does not apply to all the examples, um, but uh, um, it's, it's something uh, that often recur uh, in, in many case studies that we have uh, examined. Uh, regarding the, the nostalgia, I mean, uh, I, we really try to uh, uh, work on this research by um, not uh, having any nostalgia, but uh, having, a, I would say, almost a, a sense of desperation of how our modern uh, way of life uh, is based on the destruction of any possible alternative that these examples represent. So no, so no nostalgia, but yes, a bit of desperation, yes. I'm also beginning to understand why our hallways in in the office suites, maybe that's why we haven't exploded yet, because we <laughs> we're having lots of conversation through the walls. Okay, next. Anna Maria. Thank you so much uh, for the wonderful lecture. I, I've learned a lot uh, and it's really illustrative of your methodology. Uh, I'm going to go backwards a little bit with my question. Um, I, I, I'm going to bite. Uh, I, I, I would challenge this definition of architecture as a building defined by the division between uh, intellectual and manual labor. I think with that definition, it, art, the word architecture, which has a Western origin, uh, can only define a Western tradition as its root, and you're taking out uh, the world tradition, so you're talking about a very small subsection and tradition of architecture that occupies a big space, uh, but I, I, I would challenge that. Um, and, and going backwards into my question, um, I, um, you, you the, your method of thinking about the longhouse as a typology, in naming it longhouse, where when it has many names in each of these cultures, sure, yeah. um, you've you know pointed to Catherine de Quincy and Claude David Strauss uh, and other authors. <laughs> My question would be, what is the role of indigenous scholarship and indigenous knowledge in your research? No, you, you, I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, I, I will maybe start answering the first uh, part of your question. Um, we have been thinking a lot about this question of, uh, and, and actually through the whole research, we always, as I said before, we consider the long gas maybe the arch manifestation of architecture. I mean, our point of entry was as architects, uh, an incredible fascination for this uh, building really as architecture and uh, and uh, and only towards the end we started to question the use of this uh, term uh, because uh, for us uh, what was very important was this unity of of building let's say uh, which uh, isn't it better to destroy the word architecture sorry isn't it better to destroy what yes, the I mean, word architecture Yes, I mean, in a way, uh, I, I wouldn't destroy the word architecture, but uh, for us that, it that was... That definition, right? No, for us it was very important to uh, emphasize that uh, uh, building can be independent from architecture. That building actually, uh, you know, thinking and, and making uh, can reacquire a unity that architecture has always uh, divided. And this is actually just because uh, we were uncomfortable to apply a term that in fact in many, in many languages, in many parts of the world, this difference between building and architecture doesn't exist in fact. Uh, so our you know, conclusion was why not to use building rather than architecture as a more inclusive term through which you know, we can compare, let's say, this different uh, example, which is actually also the case of uh, European uh, examples because you know, uh, architects uh, design houses only since the 16th and 17th century. So even this distinction between uh, building and, uh, uh, and design could not, not even apply to Western uh, uh, examples. Uh, regarding the second uh, uh, question, I think we, 
gave uh, a lot of, uh, uh, especially in the, in the research, I didn't have time to really elaborate, but there is actually plenty of sources that came from uh, indigenous scholars, especially in the terminology, in use of the, of the words. Uh, we even interview some people to understand really how to translate uh, certain words that are very different, to, difficult to translate into, uh, into English. But you are right. You are right because, uh, in a way, you know, uh, both typology but also anthropology and ethnography, uh, which is actually the main knowledge through which we could access uh, this work, uh, are disciplines that uh, came into uh, being uh, under the shadow of colonialism. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, a lot of knowledge uh, uh, about even North American. Um, uh, let's say archaeology come from uh, Western uh, settlers. Uh, so in a way, you're right. I mean, it's uh, another part of this tragedy is also that a lot of knowledge uh, of these houses come from those actually who contribute to their uh, destruction. But, but there's, I just want to say for my students, and then I'll give out the mic, uh, that a, a lot of that knowledge is, is still the there, yes, and, and yes, it's important it for communities Absolutely, for that to be present. Okay. Perfect, thank you. We have a question. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'm interested in the idea of this nostalgia, and you said that there's no present form for these longhouses. Um, if we think of it not as a horizontal longhouse, but perhaps as a vertical longhouse, we do have a lot of skyscrapers, which are essentially a form of high density and proximity. And in the way that today the family unit has changed, but we do live in a very dense environment, how would you and the research that you've posed maybe offer an opportunity for the way that we live today and in our societal context? Yeah, thank you for your question. Well, I think one of the, I mean, why it would be impossible today to have long houses is that uh, the land use that we have with private property force buildings, as you said, to, to go vertical. So the idea of having a building that is, in most of cases, one story building, uh, so it has a very generous uh, footprint, uh, would be very difficult, almost uh, impossible. Uh, I don't think skyscrapers are comparable to longhouses, especially going back to what I was saying before, because the, the skyscraper being structurally uh, a very, um, Cost, uh, you know, uh, cost cost uh, cost a lot actually to build skyscrapers. They requires uh, so much capital that uh, this is not the case of longhouses where all the labor uh, was in fact uh, uh, from the community itself. And this was very important for actually the idea that longhouses were built with local materials was not just out of necessity. It was uh, for people for, uh, that inhabit longhouses a way to reinforce their uh, attachment, their symbolic alliance with the place in which they were living. Um, and this actually makes them today very difficult to establish. Although, as uh, uh, your colleague was saying before, there are cultures that still uh, resist uh, to, uh, to, to build and live otherwise, but under a lot of, uh, a lot of pressure, let's say. Saw a lot of other hands. Oh, right in front. Sorry, I'm looking up there. You're right in front of me. Okay. Um, first, thank you for your um, wonderful presentation. I think you you talked a lot about uh, spatial organization in your eight thesis, but I've uh, I found that I think the problem of material is sort of absent in this. Mm -hmm. So I I, I, do, I I like you do mention that like the Salish people, the Canadian um, indigenous people, like they sort of recycled their materials. They take it away and Build it again, and like I, I, I kept mentioning like not mentioning like like I kept noticing that a lot of the examples, the materials are actually like wood or bamboo, which is like quite like long, and then like moving on to medieval European longhouse, they like they started with stone as space, and then like built it entirely as stone. So I want to know like, did you touch on this uh, thing? Yes, actually, uh, not a very good. Uh, question, and it's a big uh, lacuna of the presentation. I deliberately uh, put aside the whole question of material, because, uh, which actually we addressed in the, in the research, especially because, as you said, uh, 
almost all the longhouses were built in timber with a uh, few exceptions where the walls, which often are not even structural, were uh, built uh, in, in stone. Um, but you know, this would require almost uh, a lecture in itself. Just let me say that uh, the question of material is very important because, uh, as I said before, especially uh, in, in modern times, people that would live in longhouses uh, were confronted uh, with uh, other villages uh, or people living in a different way. And for example, in the 20th century, also in many of these communities, you start to have houses built in concrete or built uh, in, with you know, modern materials. Uh, and their attachment uh, to uh, a certain kind of materiality, especially of the, of the post, uh, was very strong and was going beyond the necessity, which is basically, of course, that uh, timber was often the material available in their uh, area. Uh, so in a way, uh, there is something very functional, the availability of this material around, but there is also something very, very symbolic. I mean, longhouses are also a pact that many of these communities made with their own environment. Uh, and, and for them, the fact that the longhouse was built was something that they could see around, uh, was something that was going beyond the question of <laughs> sustainability, was really a very strong symbolic link between the house uh, and, the, and the landscape. Um, it's interesting that uh, the, it's true that in the Europeans, you start to see the, um, the uh, actually the, the use of stone. Uh, but uh, in uh, all the longhouse, at least the roof is always kept um, kept in in timber. Also, of course, because it was much easier to uh, to build. But also there, uh, the, the the roof, this piece of carpentry, uh, was a, another. I mean, also a very strong symbolic device to to remind to the inhabitants the the fact that they have built and 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 that the roof would bring them basically uh, them to together. Um, so, in a way, uh, when we look to longhouses, uh, we should never um, think of material or materiality in terms of uh, just use value, which certainly was an important aspect. But there was also this elaboration of uh, a symbolic, uh, let's say, uh, relationship between them and the, and the environment in which they would live. Great. I think we have time for only one more. I'm, I'm Oh, always going to give it to a student. Okay, we have two, two more. Okay, Eric, and no, 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 just, just one more. Um, I, I've just been curious. I mean, thank you for the presentation. I'm very interested in your research, and I wonder if you could talk a bit about method, um, because uh, you're borrowing on certain disciplines like anthropology, uh, and we could imagine the sort of problematics of field work. You know, how do you sort of participate in a community without while standing apart from it. And from Europe, I think this question of perspective, how do you research a kind of global architectural phenomena while remaining outside of it? Uh, tell us about your method, um, because some of it, I imagine, is speaking to scholars and anthropologists, but also measuring. I don't know. I'm curious, did you go measure? Did you visit? You know, Who did you talk? Just That's a dumb question, but it would be so helpful to illuminate the methodology. Yes, no, thank you for this question, which uh, of course is crucial. Um, I should say that uh, mm, most of our research was based on other people's research. Uh, I didn't have the time to mention that in my lecture because I, I should have footnote basically everything <laughs> that I've said. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, this research was mostly a bibliographical uh, really collection of uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, research. And during the research, we had the chance to speak uh, uh, a lot with uh, archaeologists and anthropologists who have done uh, specific research on specific case studies. In our case, uh, the idea was to make a compendium. So we didn't have time and possibility to do actually field work. Uh, uh, I should also say that uh, mm, you know to do field work costs uh, a lot, uh, and uh, this is really a research done in a in a practice uh, in between projects, uh, 
and uh, we didn't have the resources to do proper field work, also of 42 actually case studies, many of which actually don't exist anymore, and you can only learn from them through, through literature. Uh, but actually, when uh, we had a chance to find uh, someone who was actually, who had done research uh, on a specific case study, we would actually involve this person in the, in also in understanding uh, uh, the language uh, and the terms that uh, are often used. Actually, one of the most difficult part, going back to the previous question, was really the nomenclature of, of this research. Because as you have seen in my lecture, I use often words like public and private, uh, and even communal. Actually, these are all words that are very problematic, uh, that you don't have actually a, a, a direct translation in many languages of the people who build these longhouses. So yes, I, I, the method that you can say this is still very architectural. It's still the method of architects analyzing through um, sections, through plans, uh, through the conventional means uh, of architecture, uh, cultures that in a way challenge uh, that uh, tradition. But I have to say that for me, the tension uh, between uh, the object of research and the method that, the, uh, that we use was one of the most fascinating uh, struggle uh, through this whole work. Yeah. We have a, a last Hi. question. Yes. Um, my question is very, very closely related. Um, I'm wondering, after having done all this research, um, if you could speak directly to um, what you feel are the possibilities and also very critical limitations of um, kind of architecture engaging with ethnography as method and with anthropology um, more broadly, um, especially given that it's a very much criticized and also very self-critical field. Yes. No. In fact, uh, uh, we, we we were very aware of that, uh, and uh, and um, we. I mean, we really were very careful in constantly uh, defining the perspective through which we were looking to these examples. As I said before, this is really an architectural research at the end, which use a lot of sources that come from anthropology and archaeology, and. We know that uh, these disciplines are uh, very intertwined with the history of, of colonialism. I mean, the idea of itself of ethnographic research, ethnos means the other. So in a way, these are disciplines that consider everything that they study something other. Um, at the same time, uh, I think that uh, in those research, there is always something valuable, uh, something important that allow us to uh, really mm, defamiliarize the idea that we have of both architecture, but especially of domestic space. In a way, it might sound a bit selfish, but one of the, for us, main um, reason for such a research was to defamiliarize our own idea of domestic space, which often is so naturalized that we take it for granted. Um, so in a way, looking to these uh, uh, models is a way to understand that what we inhabit today is only one uh, aspect of a, of a multiplicity of way of life that unfortunately we have lost or, or destroyed. Well, I, that, that, that would be maybe the self-critical aspect also from our side, let's say. That's a, that's a, um, a, a very helpful way to, for us to actually to conclude this evening. Um, I, there are so many more things we could talk about, the axonometric and all these other things and ways in which you are, uh, which you are actually, is, but we don't have time. So, but I just wanted to thank you again. It's been great to have you here. We're grateful for your talk. <laughs>